A week ago this past Wednesday night, we were trying to answer questions, and one that uh, Brother Buddy had put out that we intended to carry through this past Wednesday night had to do with transgenders and so forth. And, uh, of course, this past Wednesday I had an episode take place with diverticulitis and the best laid plans of mice and men all the time to go astray. But that is said simply to indicate that I think I will just go ahead and do the rest of that that I intended as a sermon this morning. And I think we all recognize, as was mentioned by uh, Brother John, that we're on this year celebrating the 4th of July on this Sunday. Well, of course, that means that we are having in this nation supposedly the celebration of the Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. This, of course, was the official day that it took place. But it seems to me, while when you read within that declaration and then later on the Constitution, that a lot of folks have lost sight of what the whole thing is all about. And people nowadays are pretty much declaring their independence from God and Christ and the Bible and absolute objective truth and about anything else that connects to belief in God as he reveals himself in the scriptures. And I want to quote a passage of scripture that we know here quite often, or at least we hear quoted quite often. It's familiar to us, but it tells us the standard why, whereby we should judge all things, first of all, including ourselves as we examine ourselves to see whether we are acceptable to God in what we believe in practice. Paul told Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work. People have simply removed the scriptures from their lives and replaced them with other things. First of all, they've done it. And this fits directly into understanding what's going on as far as homosexuality is concerned, uh, transgender and other things of that nature. If you talk to those folks, they simply will tell you they do not believe in absolute objective truth. Now, what does that mean? Well, absolute or objective truth is that, for, well, let's just start with truth. Truth is that which corresponds with the reality. Now, can you see how that would be a problem with somebody who is a man that wants to be a woman or vice versa? If uh, one of your children and you actually thought was wanting to be a dog, and it wasn't just a passing phrase of being a child, and just cultivated being a dog after it was 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 16, uh, would you be a little concerned? Would you think something mentally is wrong? But now it's being advocated as the thing to do, independence, and a choice because nobody can determine who's male or female simply by birth. But we need to keep in mind that truth, though, is objective. That means it is outside of us. It doesn't depend upon whether you're male or female. It doesn't depend upon anything like that. Your background, your culture, truth is truth and always will be truth regardless of what men think of it. I know of a college professor that taught that, well, you can't know the truth. Just ask him, are you sure? Because in making that statement, you cannot know absolute truth. You have made a truth claim. And do you have to go all the way through a PhD before you can see that? And so people tend to believe what they want to believe to do what they want to do. And since our moorings have been so removed from the absolute, ob absolute means it is not going to change, from God and the Bible, then there's no telling what you can experience today. Now, Jesus taught us something, and we've already touched on this, but sometimes we don't realize how far our teaching goes and what it really implies in Matthew 6 verse 27 this of course is in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount and he asked his audience and so he asked us which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature now that's a rhetorical question he knew they were going to say none of us 
we can we can concentrate as hard as we want to concentrate if I'm a five foot man and I want to be six feet. Well, if you're fully grown, concentrate all you want. Do all the thinking and wishing and planning and whatever. And when you get through with all that, your intense thinking will not change you from being five feet tall to six feet tall. That's what the Lord's saying. He takes it so simple on the level and teaches this way. Well, what about when it comes to changing your gender? Well, I want to be a woman. I want to be a man. And I think so hard about it. Well, yeah, but they can go have all this surgery. Remember what we said last week? That's cosmetic. Test the DNA. Just take Bruce Jenner, for example. I call him Bruce Jenner because that was his name. He was a he. Hey, he still is a he. Now, he says he's not a he. His mind's messed up. There's the problem. He doesn't recognize absolute truth. He wants to be something he is not. And the facts denied in his life. There's the problem. When you reject absolute objective truth, and you see people saying, well, let's hear Gary's truth. Let's hear J.D.'s truth. Let's hear my truth. Well, what this is? Well, remember, truth corresponds to reality. Well, a lot of folks don't believe that. And you say, well, my reality is not your reality. Anybody ever heard of schizophrenia? That's where people have a tough time dealing with the reality over and against fantasy. And people talk about that nowadays. Truth of the matter is, we've got a lot of folks in that mess because they have been taught some something somewhere down the years about the non-existence of God. Of course, that means the Bible is not the Word of God. There is no spiritual anything. Everything's fleshly, and it's all left up to us what it will be. Let me notice this one thing. I did touch on some of this in our class. This movement claims that people are what they claim to be regardless of contrary evidence. The fact of the matter is they do not believe in factual evidence. They don't believe the facts. If somebody ever tells you, just give me the truth. I don't want the facts. Run. The research in anything, whether it's empirical knowledge or whatever, means you're examining what's available. You're trying to discover facts in the case. And you put various things together. You reason correctly with them, and you come to a conclusion. Listen to this. Biological sex isn't something we're actually born with. It's something that doctors or our parents assign us at birth. Now, let's think for a minute along that line. You don't know, let's say you don't go to the doctor to find out what you're getting, which medical science allows us to do nowadays when you're expecting a child. Let me ask you this. What gives you any idea whatsoever that she's going to have a child? Maybe a cucumber. How do you know? The truth of the matter is, if that cucumber gets here, <laughs> well, the thing to do is say, well, this is not a cucumber, it's a child, <laughs> and it'll be a child. Or if the baby gets here, then you don't pay any attention to what biologically it is sexually. You just decide you want this little boy to be a little girl because you've always wanted a girl and you've got 15 boys. You've got to have a girl. Okay, so you have another boy. What's reality? Whatever I want it to be. Now, with the control parents have over their children, don't tell me they can't start having all sorts of sex work done cosmetically on that child and bring that little boy up as a girl. You think, oh, that can happen. Brother, quit saying it can't happen. Stuff's happening right now that 20 years ago you would have never thought would happen. And for those of us who've been a while and a while, I've been preaching, I was 18, I'm 74, I'll be like kids, I'm 74 and a half now. <laughs> I've seen it go to where nobody would believe that homosexuality would have any kind of way or influence in America but we were preaching some of us then yes it can 
And when you look back at the state of the world before the flood, at the state of Sodom and Gomorrah, or even before that, the Tower of Babel, and you look at the state of the Canaanite tribes at the time Israel came into them, if you ever study about how those folks lived, their morality was about as bad as, there's just no way, I, I couldn't even talk about some of the immoral things they did in mixed company. I find it hard to talk about anywhere. Oh, but that'll never happen. Where do we ever come up? That's fantasy on our part. Men left without God, especially if they're desiring not to retain God in their knowledge, then they're desiring not to retain His control over their life, and thus they're going to reject the Bible, and they're going to eventually not just reject these things, they will in your face with it and militantly oppose anybody that teaches contrary to what they believe. That's where we're turning to now. That's exactly where we're turning to now. This other quote coming from this person. Biological sex is an ambiguous word that has no scale and no meaning besides that it is related to some sex characteristics. Now that's gobbledygook. If you had that person stand up here and say, define each term of what you just said. You'd probably have to have that defined and whatever they said then defined again. Now here's one supposed expert, a Dr. Deanna Adkins, and she claims, quote, it is counter to medical science to use chromosomes, internal reproductive organs, external genitalia, or secondary sex characteristics to override gender identity for purposes of classifying someone as male or female. This is a, quote, scientist, medical doctor, and they make those kind of comments. That's denying the facts of reality. It is saying that the very area of empirical knowledge and a physical being I can't accept. That's basically what they're saying. I'll go back to my old microphone illustration. I don't want that to be a microphone. So it's not a microphone. And that's my truth. And you come back and say, but now let's look at the definition of a microphone and let's look at the facts regarding a microphone. Just start by defining the word and you're going through the whole thing. It's connected to a public address system, etc. And when you get through, they look at you like a deer caught in the headlight to say, I don't accept that. You know, Paul asked the Thessalonians to pray for him over several things. And one of the things he asked to be for them to remember about him and his work as an apostle and a preacher of the gospel, pray for me that we be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. You will never have saving faith in God in view of the fact that faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, when people are unreasonable. And what does it mean to be unreasonable? I'm not going to accept the facts of the case. I have my mindset, and that's where the old thing comes up. I, you know, uh, don't, my mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. And it also tells us how strongly a wish or a desire can cause us to deceive ourselves. Remember how the devil did it with Eve? She told him plainly what God told them they could not do regarding that fruit. And then he goes through this deceitful process. God's holding something back from you. You'll know you'll be like him if you eat that fruit. And then she practiced what was a part of the physical being, even when it was sinless. That is the appetites of the flesh, less of the flesh, less of the part of life. And you read the descriptions. He thought it was something to make her wise, taste good, etc. And what did she do? She knew the commandment. But she had desires, strong desires. And she took of the fruit. She took of it and ate it and gave it to Adam and he ate it. One commandment and she couldn't keep that. She couldn't show her confidence, faith, trust, and love of God that he knew better about how to take care of her. That one commandment, she broke it, and death entered the world. What does that tell us? Go down through the whole of the Old Testament, 
And it's just time and time again, people did what they wanted to do no matter what God said. That's where we are today. We need to know that truth is fixed and unchanging. We need to know that when people get to a stage to where they cannot see reality, they need to be helped if they possibly can be. And yet that's being condoned nowadays. This is what bothers me. Intellectual fantasy, fantasy is being condoned. The rejection of facts in the case is being frowned at. So people don't go along those lies. And yet the Bible, such as in Proverbs 14, verse 5, says truth is the opposite of lies. Now here we're dealing with liars who demand that we deny facts. You know what you do about something like that? Just go ahead and accept the facts anyway. And try to impress upon everybody that what they're doing is saying, we don't accept the facts. We have a desire to be whatever. Remember the man who wants to be six feet and he's five feet. You take thought about that all day long, and it's not going to change anything. And then remember, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It's always been the case. It happens not only in religious matters, but it happen, happens in every other thing. Truth is consistent. Truth endures, Proverbs 12, verse 19. Why should sex be determined differently in humans than other mammals? As far as I know, they're not saying, well, I was hoping to get this colt. For those not knowing, that's a baby horse. I want to get this colt. In fact, it's a male baby horse, <laughs> not a filly. But I wanted a filly. So I'm going to have this male horse a filly. Well, you can neuter, neuter the thing, make it a gelding. But I never have heard anybody that made a horse a gelding that says it was female. <laughs> Why? If I want a female, it'll be a female. God made mankind as male and female. This, to me, would be one of the things I would really start with, and just let them fuss about it all they wanted to. Know this verse, Genesis 1:27. In the beginning, God created man in his own image. The image of God, uh, God created them. Male and female, he created them. He didn't say male, female, whatever. He didn't. That's one thing you need to keep in mind. And why should sex be determined differently in humans than in other mammals? Why? Why should it? Make them answer that. The American Psychological Association is stating that gender identity, and I'm quoting here, is a person's internal sense of being male, female, and they get this, or something else. Or something else. Let me ask you women, what does it feel like to be a woman? You men, what does it feel like to be a man? That does nothing. And certainly, how does a man know what it feels like to be a woman, and a woman know what it feels like to be a man? What are you talking about? doesn't make sense. That goes with anything. Whatever you think or feel, it's just that way. Now, should this approach be applied to other areas? Here's a fellow seven foot tall, and he says, I feel like I'm short. So I can go through small openings. <laughs> I feel like I'm 14. Now, really, if I stood here before you, and you knew I really meant this, that I feel like I'm 14, and I don't know really what it says to say I when I was 14, did you know that you were feeling like you were 14? Well, if you were feeling, you, I guess you could say in the facts of the case, since I know I'm 14, then I guess this is what it's like to feel 14. <laughs> but the thing about it is, if I'm feeling like I'm 14, whatever that means, uh, hey, I don't have the responsibility of a job. Mom and Dad still got to support me. I've did a lot of folks like that nowadays. They're always 14. <laughs> Once 14, always 14. I feel like I'm a Native American. Well, we kind of heard a few folks do things like that, politically speaking. So that means I can join a tribe. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. Feelings do not change reality. And reality is determined by the facts in the case, and the facts speak for themselves. And truth is determined by all the facts that bear upon a thing when you gather it together. And that's the only way we know what it is. 
Consider this in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. Psalm 139, 13 and 14. He says, you, for, you, you formed my inward parts. Talked about um, weaving them together in his mother's womb. And he gives thanks for that. And then he makes a statement we've all quoted, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knoweth it right well. 139, 13, and 14. But if God doesn't exist, the Bible's not the Word of God, then I don't have to pay attention to that because truth is my truth. My feelings are whatever. And if I feel like a monkey, <laughs> I don't know what a monkey feels, but if I feel like a monkey, I'll be a monkey. God had a reason for cre creating two distinct genders. That's why in the inspired Word of God, since God put us together, He knows how we best function. Then He made a woman to be a, help, a helper suitable, is a good way to put that, a suitable help for man, Genesis 2.18. And we studied a while back on this, but that's the reason God gave different roles for males and females. We won't go back into a detail of that, but you read your Bible, you know He has. But of course, that's rejected nowadays, isn't it? In fact, everything about God in the Bible concerning general social matters is just about rejected. The law of Moses prohibited men and women from portraying themselves as being the other gender. I don't know whether we realize that or not, but that's what God did for the Jews under the law of Moses. A woman shall not wear a man's clothing, nor shall a man put on a woman's clothing. For whoever does these things is an abomination to your God. Deuteronomy 22, 5. Now, I'm not binding that today on anybody because that's the law of Moses for the Jews. But it does say this, and it was written a four time for our learning, according to Paul, Romans 15, 4. And you do have specific declarations about what it means to be modest in the New Testament. It tells me that a man has no business trying to cross dress, trying to appear as the opposite sex, or vice versa, for that matter. Cross dressing is not the same thing as transgenderism I know that but still trying to appear in what society says a man trying to appear in what society says is a woman or vice versa that's exactly what God was saying to the children of Israel that time don't appear to be like these pagans in any form or fashion and the church spiritual Israel needs to be mindful of the fact that the New Testament teaches us how to be different from worldly, ungodly people. It doesn't necessarily have to do with appearance, but it does too. Somebody says, well, I'm a Christian. I'm of Christ. And they're running around on the beach with a string on. They're not of Christ. I don't care what they're saying. And so on, you can take that in your own thinking. So the point of this passage is to show God's expectations for the two genders to be distinct and recognized. How we feel about ourselves may not always reflect reality. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick or wicked. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. That's talking about a person who's not directed by God through God's Word, who will not be done. They're left to all sorts of problems. And that's why mentally they have a lot of problems. You remember that when Jesus, through the Spirit by John the Apostle, addressed the church in Laodicea, <coughs> he says uh, they felt, they, they had the feeling, they viewed themselves as being rich, wealthy, and that you don't have need of anything. But the Lord saw correcting what they would not see. And he said their spiritual condition is wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, Revelation 3.17. Yes, it is possible for a male to feel, and I have to put that in quotes because I don't know exactly how to say it otherwise, like a female or want to be female. It's possible to imagine anything or vice versa. But that does not make it a reality. 
Now think for a minute. Every good actor or actress is able to portray a part that is not really what they are. You know the Greek word from whence actor comes, or from our word hip actually hypocrite comes, which is mean the person playing a part, not really them. Well, actor comes from Hippocrates. It means to play a part. And so when you get somebody who has to go through all sorts of psychological warp, who's a male, wants to be a female, I'll take Bruce Jenner again since he's as good as any that I can think of. And they go through all this thing trying to appear. All they've done is simply appear to be something. They're playing a part. As deranged as it might be, they're playing a part. So feelings don't change reality. Now, you've got to realize that applies to people in religion. You can feel like you're saved from your sins. But if you have not believed and obeyed the gospel of Christ, God's power to save from sin, Romans 1.16, then you can feel saved all day long. But you won't be. Do you remember when the brothers sold Joseph into Egypt they took his coat of many colors and they dipped it in the blood of goat they made it appear that a wild animal had taken and eaten him and they took it and lied to their father but his response his feelings in believing that lie was as real as it could be because he simply thought he's dead and he's gone. And for years and years and years, he thought Joseph was dead. Well, we know the end of the story, don't we? Make a long story short, Joseph finally reveals to his brothers down in Egypt because God in his providence said, let Joseph, second only to Pharaoh, actually he was doing all that to prepare a way to save the people from whence would come eventually Israel. And so jo Jacob finds out that he's alive. But now what would it take to prove to him that he was alive when for years he had been believing he was dead? He saw the coat of many colors. He saw the blood. He heard the deceitful report of his brothers that he was killed. It was the facts in the matter that said he was alive. So you can feel one way all you want to feel as far as that's concerned. It does not make it reality. And you can feel like whatever you think a woman feels like or a tree feels like. Have you ever noticed anything? I don't know whether anybody has ever taken I haven't, but uh, I've seen it and I've read about it. Uh, actors' classes. You know some of the things they do to train them to portray that which they know they are not. They'll make them sometimes get on stage and act like a donkey or act like a dog. And sometimes we used to joke, saying, make like a tree and leave. <laughs> they will actually have them stand there and like this for a long time on stage. What are they trying to do to those folks? Teaching them how to imagine something so they can portray something. And very good actors cause their audience to think, well, that's the way they really are. And so they're very surprised if they ever get to know an actor personally. They're not like that at all. I remember a quote from Cary Grant, which, of course, for some young people, you may not even know who that is. But he was talking about his reputation and being... Cary Grant. And he told somebody, he said, well, I have no idea what all people mean by that, but I see how they react to Cary Grant, and a lot of times I wish I was. <laughs> because he could portray a part. And that's what these people are doing. What we're dealing with, and I'm going to close here, when it comes to homosexuality, especially the transgender part of it, is that we're in a battle for truth. 
and what truth is. And who has the ultimate truth? Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31, 32. He prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, think for a minute. They know not what they do. They did not recognize Jesus because they denied the facts that proved he was Jesus. He also said, Father, sanctify them. Set them apart from the way the world operates. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. And Paul said, preach the word. The anchor of the soul is God through the word of God. And to get started, you become a Christian by believing with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. As your belief is formed by the truth of God's word, Romans 10, 17. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. And be immersed in water by the authority of Christ under the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission or forgiveness of your sins. Matthew 28, 18, verses following, Acts 2, verse 38. The Lord adds you to His church when you do that. The kingdom of God, John 3, 3 and 5, Acts 2, verse 47, 42, 41, 38. That's the way it works. It doesn't work any other way. The gospel is God's power to save. He doesn't save any other way. You must believe it and you must comply with it from the heart, Romans 6, 17 and 18, or you cannot be saved. Now, you can leave here saying, I'm already saved, but I haven't obeyed the gospel. You're living in a fantasy world. And you need to face the facts of truth that's set out in the Word of God and become a Christian by obeying the gospel. As a child of God, I say the same thing. If you're saying I'm living a righteous, godly life in the church, and yet your actions are not so, you're living in a fantasy world. And so we need to be able to realize where we are and what we're doing. We can only do that if we look into the perfect law of liberty and honestly look into our lives and see, am I living like the Bible says a Christian should? If not, repent of those things, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. That's God's second law of pardon for the child of God. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.